Good evening, darlings and deviants. My name is Lucy, and I'm just a little loony. So with play boosters on the horizon, we're going to be seeing a bit of a shift in magic design. More rares per pack, a change to limited with special guests and list cards out in the wild, but something people aren't really talking about is how set booster exclusive commander cards are getting the axe. While I'm all for this change because it was extremely confusing for people just opening boosters and their limited availability made them hidden from most commander players, I do think it's a bit of a bummer that these unique designs were buried under the commander decks and a lack of popular access. So, with the concept on its way out, I'd like to go over each and every card from this series. We'll go over these two sets at a time so I don't drop one massive video and overwhelm all of y'all. Don't worry, if you want to watch them all at once, I'll put them all together at the end. So, without further ado, Let's start the show. So first things first, what in the non-specific deity am I talking about? Well, back in Innistrad Midnight Hunt, the idea of commander-only cards available only in set and collector's boosters was introduced. This idea didn't even last a standard rotation? Huh. They were received. The sentence is over. It doesn't really help that the first suite of these cards were, for lack of a better word, excessively middling. Let me show you what I mean. The first card I want to talk about will help explain the second, so first it goes. Curse of Obsession is four and a red for an enchantment or a curse that enchants a player. Curses are a specialty of the Innistrad block that basically debuffs your opponents. This one says, at the beginning of enchanted player's draw step, that player draws two additional cards. Well, I don't want my opponents to draw more cards, so what's the catch here? And it also says, at the beginning of enchanted player's instep, that player discards their hand. Ah, there we go. This basically makes whoever you're playing against play off the top three cards of their deck for the rest of the game. Especially brutal if you combine it with cards like Spirit of the Labyrinth, which makes it so only one card can be drawn per turn. And this leads us right into... Lind, a cheerful tormentor, is one, a blue, a black, and a red for a 2-4 legendary human warlock with death touch, and whenever a curse is put into your graveyard from the battlefield, Return it to the battlefield, attached to you at the beginning of the next instep. But wait, Lucy, why would I want to put curses on myself? I don't want to discard my whole hand. Well, her second ability covers that. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may attach a curse attached to you to one of your opponents. If you do, draw two cards. Linda gave us an actual curse commander, which was pretty nice. However, her only being Grixis keeps us out of a lot of the Enchantress cards that make enchantment decks really cool and some of the cooler curses like Overwhelming Splendor. While all of the curses are mainly in these three colors, not having that support makes her a little bit underwhelming. Avacyn's Memorial is five and three white, really expensive, for a legendary artifact with indestructible and other legendary permanents you control have indestructible. Avacyn's Memorial is very good if you can't afford Avacyn herself. Otherwise, this card is just kind of way too expensive mana-wise, and it's not protecting your non-legendary permanents at all. Plus, exile effects aren't hard to come by nowadays, so the memorial isn't exactly honoring the big girl's memory super well. Uh, rest in peace. The last one from Midnight Hunt is actually a cycle of five. There's 88 of these, y'all. I gotta use your time and my time efficiently. The Vision Cycle includes a set of sorceries called Visions of Glory, Duplicity, Dread, Ruin and Dominance. Visions of Glory is four and a white to make a 1-1 one, one human creature token for each creature you control. Visions of Duplicity is two and a blue to exchange control of two target creatures. Okay, you don't control why? Visions of Dread is two and a black for an opponent to choose a creature card from their graveyard to put into play under your control. Mm. Visions of Ruin makes each opponent sacrifice an artifact and you get a treasure token for each one. And Visions of Dominance puts a plus one plus one counter on a creature, then doubles the number of counters on said creature. They all have flashback of eight and two of its respective color. It gets reduced by the total mana value of your biggest commander. So if you're playing Visions of Dread in Lind, for example, the flashback cost is four and two black because Lind's total mana value is four. These are all very interesting cards, really. But frankly, they're all way too expensive for these sorts of effects. There's better cards for these effects. That flashback cost is way kind of out there unless your commander is at least six or more mana. And even if it is, I don't really want to play any of these effects that badly. If I had to choose the best one, I'd probably pick Visions of Dread because at least you're getting something every time. And there's some pretty big black commanders like Tassiger that aren't actually six mana, and you can sort of uh, get some extra value there. But even then, 
None of these really impress me unless I'm playing a 6 plus mana commander, and even then they're only okay. So with Crimson Foul right around the corner, the bar for these set booster exclusive commander cards was, I'll be real, the bar was on the floor. But this set gave us some really cool and interesting designs that are actually pretty good. Breathkeeper Seraph is 4 and 2 white for a 4-4 angel with flying and soul bond. Spoiler alert, the next four cards have soul bond, so let me explain that real quick. When a creature with soul bond or another unpaired creature comes into play, you can pair it with said unpaired creature. They remain paired for as long as they both stick around on the field. If the creature Seraph is bonded to dies and another creature comes in later, then Seraph can team up with that creature. If Seraph dies, and the paired creature loses their friend. You may cry now. So what's this angel friend do? Well, as long as Breathkeeper Seraph is paired with another creature, each of those creatures has. When this creature dies, you may return it to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next instep. This is not only very good wrath protection, but it's also useful in everything from Voltron strategies to sacrifice decks. Six mana is a lot, but unlike the last set, this effect is actually worth 6 mana. Imperious Mindbreaker is 1 and 2 blue for a 1-4 human wizard with soul bond, and as long as Imperious Mindbreaker is paired with another creature, each of those creatures has, whenever this creature attacks, each opponent mills cards equal to its toughness. I'll be honest, this card's not super amazing. There's better effects if you're trying to mill that don't really require you to get into the red zone. I'm not a big fan, personally. Also, what's going on in this art? That doesn't look like friendship at all to me. Doomweaver is 4 and 2 black for a 1-8 spider horror with reach and soul bond. It's got a really big booty. As long as Doomweaver is paired with another creature, each of those creatures has, when this creature dies, draw cards equal to its power. Like the Seraph, this card is pretty good in an aristocrat style deck, but it's not as general use since it doesn't really work well with its own ability, being only one power. It's an all-star in spider typo though. Mirage Phalanx is 4 and 2 red for a 4-4 human soldier with soul bond and as long as Mirage Phalanx is paired with another creature, each of those creatures has, at the beginning of combat on your turn, create a token that's a copy of this creature except it has haste and loses soul bond. Exile it at the end of combat. This card was only kind of okay in my opinion until Doctor Who came out and the Master Multiplied hit Commander like a freight train. Mirage Phalanx is an all-star in that deck and honestly, Pairing this with a solid ETB effect even outside of the Master isn't too bad either. Thundering Mightmare is 4 and a green for a 3-3 Horse Spirit with Soul Bond and, as long as Thundering Mightmare is paired with another creature, each of those creatures has, whenever an opponent casts a spell, put a plus one plus one counter on this creature. Personally, I think this card's the best of the lot. Making two creatures into Mana Gorger Hydras, or making a Mana Gorger Hydra get twice as many triggers is just amazing. Also, the green creature in this cycle not being the most expensive nor the biggest is making my brain confused. Sure, it'll probably be the biggest by the time it gets around to your turn, but it's a weird anomaly nevertheless. Hollow Hinge Overlord is 4 and 2 green for a 4-4 wolf with flash and, at the beginning of your upkeep, for each creature you control that's a wolf or a werewolf, create a 2-2 green wolf creature token. This card is very expensive and a bit of a win more, but if you land it in your werewolf or wolf deck on a decent board, it can get out of hand very quickly. Keep in mind, if you have a creature that's both a wolf and a werewolf, it only counts for once for this effect. A creature may have that dog in them, but they only have one dog in them. Okay, now we're getting into the big boys now. If by boys you mean terrifying monstrosities from beyond the mortal realms of thought. I guess that's not really gendered. Umbris Fear Manifest is three and a blue and a black. For a 1-1 Nightmare Horror- wait no come back, I swear it's a good card! Umbers gets plus one plus one for each card your opponent owns in exile, and whenever they or another Nightmare or Horror comes into play under your control, target opponent exiles cards from the top of their library until they exile a land card. Umbers is not only a fantastic typo commander for both Nightmares and Horrors, but it's also a form of mill that has hands. If you're playing Umbers, you're declaring your intent. You are going to be a nightmare to your opponents, or a horror, depending on which ones you're putting into your deck. Wedding Ring is quite possibly the ideal commander card. It's weird and it takes a bunch of times reading it to fully understand everything that it does. Wedding Ring is 2 and 2 white for an artifact that, when it comes into play, you give an opponent a copy of it if it was cast. It has two abilities that basically bundle into if you or you're the opponent you give the wedding ring to, draw or gain life during your own turns, the other person gets that effect as well. For example, if I attack with a 5 power lifelink creature, my fiancé in question gets 5 life. Then once it gets to their turn and they draw a card to start their turn, I draw a card. It's a funny card that kind of looks a little group huggy, but if you're a deck that mostly plays during your opponent's turns, you'll mainly be doing these things on any other turn besides your own. 
it'll quickly end up benefiting you more than anyone else. Plus, you can bounce it and put rings on everyone and form a very complex polyamorous relationship. Love wins! And with that, that's all of the set booster exclusive commander cards in Midnight Hunt and Crimson Vow. Did you discover a new card that got your brewing brains a brewin'? Let me know down in the comments below. As always, thank you all so, so, so very much for watching, and until next time, au revoir!